Number 10, Avengers 1 million BC, Earth 616. All right, look, I promise this is the only Earth 616 story I'm mentioning. But given the team and the story, how can I not? The Avengers of 1 million BC came together in the prehistoric era to face Zagreb the Aspirant, basically a mad celestial. The team was made up of Odin Bor's son, wielding Mjolnir, the mutant Firehair, the avatar of the Phoenix Force, the sorcerer Agamotto, like the Eye of Agamotto, that guy, Fan Fei the Iron Fist, the first ever Black Panther of the Panther Tribe, a mammoth riding Ghost Rider, and Starbrand. They first appeared in Marvel Legacy number one in 2017, and I'm not even going to explain the rest. Just go read it, please! Earth 76611, alternate history. In Fantastic Four, annual number 11 in 1976, Power Man knocked a vibranium cylinder into Mr. Fantastic's time platform, sending it back in time. The cylinder was split in two halves. The important to this topic half landed in occupied France in 1942 and created an alternate branching timeline, Earth 76611. In this alternate timeline, the socialist Germans used the vibranium to advance their war effort, successfully invading England in 1943 and even making it to Manhattan by 1944, taking over America by 1946. That's what half a cylinder of vibranium can do, apparently. The Fantastic Four realized what happened though and through some confusing time foolery, they managed to prevent this timeline from replacing the Earth 616 timeline. Number eight, Earth 9591, Ruins. This alternate reality is going to be the most recent one, taking place in the 90s. The timing of this one doesn't factor so much into its story though, as the more relevant detail is that this is the universe where literally everything goes wrong. The entire Fantastic Four, except Ben Grimm, who was replaced by Victor Von Doom, died on their test flight. The X-Men are held in a prison in Texas where they are horribly disfigured to stop them from using their powers. Peter Parker's spider bite caused an infectious rash that mutated his entire body and caused his hair to fall out. Bruce Banner becomes a monstrous mass of tumors. The Avengers all died in a rebellion. The Silver Surfer went mad, wanting to know what it was like to breathe air again. Nick Fury became a cannibal. All sort of that really lovely stuff, you know? I would not read this story unless you're okay with being upset, but I would read this story because it's good and it's Interesting. Number seven, Earth 6799, 1967 Spider-Man cartoon. Bouncing off that happy little lovely tale, we have Earth 6799, or just Earth 67, which is actually the Earth where the 1967 Spider-Man takes place. Because of that, this Earth technically first appeared in Spider-Man Episode 1 Season 1 on September 9th, 1967. Its comic book appearance first comes in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, Number 9, as one of the many, many alternate Spider-Man featured in this story. He also shows up in Spider-Verse Team-Up Issue Number 2, when Miles Morales and Peter Parker come to this Earth to find Spider-Man and recruit him to the fight against the Inheritors. It's super entertaining. Number 6. Earth 84243, Conan in the modern days 70s. Some people may not know this, but Conan the Barbarian is actually part of Marvel Comics. And while the era he lived in, the Hyborian Age, is part of the 616 continuity, the what if story on Earth 79213 isn't. Instead of being in the Hyborian Age though, our boy Conan gets stuck in the 20th century. After visiting the Hyborian trade city of Akbitana, he is captured by a wizard who specializes in time travel. And instead of escaping, he is transported to Manhattan on July 13th, 1977. What does he decide to do with himself? Well, after scaring off some punks and throwing an old lady in a trash can, he has a romantic encounter with a modern age lady, Danette, who shows him the Guggenheim Museum which reminds him of an ancient citadel and they go to investigate. Here, he fights off some muggers and then gets struck by magical lightning that transports him back through time to his Hyborian age. But at least he got to keep Danette's cap as a reminder of their romance. 
Number five, Wonder Girl. Wonder Girl is great, and we don't honestly talk about her enough. But I guess what I should really say in regards to this list is the Wonder Girls are great. Well, initially, the first Wonder Girl appeared as a younger version of Diana Prince in Wonder Woman issue 105 in 1959. I think the more common Wonder Girl we all think of when the moniker is mentioned, or at least most of us think of, I definitely think of, is Donna Troy. Donna Troy made her first appearance in The Brave and the Bold issue number 60 in 1965, and her look has come a long way since then. But also, she's not the only Wonder Girl anymore. There's also now Cassie Sandspark, and the more recent addition from the Brazilian Amazon, Yara Flor, with each of these Wonder Girls possessing their own very unique look. And at number four is Daredevil. Since some of you guys hated that Amanda used superhero names that were taken up by another character for part one, I'm gonna be a massive troll and do it again! Know why I don't care? Because the costume that Elektra dons when she assumes the Daredevil name is freaking awesome. I absolutely love this costume. It is different enough from any of Matt Murdock's costumes to make you look twice or three times, but retains elements that make it clear that this is still Daredevil. That point is actually a combo because Elektra has also never looked like this before either, so wham bam, there you go. Now, her time as Daredevil was honestly somewhat short, but in my eyes, it was kind of iconic. So much so that I believe her time with the costume did transfer over some elements to the most recent iteration of Matt's costume. Now he's got that sweet neck scarf hood thing going on with the more athletic looking pants. It's much more of a ninja inspired look and I personally will take it over his classic look any day. Sorry, not sorry. Number three, Robin. On my part one for this list, I talked about Jason Todd's Robin, but many of the characters that we originally knew as Robin have changed over the years when it comes to their appearance. Don't worry, I'm not gonna talk about how all the Robins are technically different people, which could be confusing to people that have read different eras of different comics. Well, won't do that again. Although I already did it with Superman, so you might be coming for me anyways. But. For this point on this list, we're gonna be talking about one of the most classic Robins, Dick Grayson. I would say actually the most classic Robin. Dick Grayson was the first Robin, and not only has his look changed, his whole identity and main location has as well. Dick Grayson would eventually grow up to become a hero in his own right, Nightwing. While trained by Batman and definitely seeing Bruce as someone he looked up to, Dick ultimately branched out on his own, even going on to form the Teen Titans. Later, just the Titans, because you know, they're no longer teenagers, and leading the team all on his own as well, which is pretty impressive. As Nightwing, Dick currently tends to operate more often in Bloodhaven, a city outside of, but I believe a short distance away from Gotham, with its own crime and corruption to deal with, that in some ways makes it seem even more bleak than Gotham. And at number two is Bucky Barnes. This is probably one of the biggest and most drastic changes of most comic book characters. I think the only thing that stays the same is the domino mask. Even the man underneath the mask has changed. When Bucky Barnes first came into Marvel Comics, Comics in 1940, he was the young sidekick to Captain America with his star spangled belt, blue shorts over top of his bread right skin tight pants and the stylish bright blue jacket with the yellow collar. A classic look not reminiscent of Robin at all. At least he wasn't showing as much skin as Robin did sometimes. His outfit was at least somewhat more believable than Robin's given he was operating in World War II. But that was then. If you showed someone who'd only ever read the old stories a picture of what Bucky Barnes looks like now, they would have no idea what had happened. I mean, we got long, edgy hair, a whole lot more muscle, a pretty much all black and gray tactical look, sometimes with a face mask to cover his mouth and nose, with a hell of a lot of firepower, and oh yeah, his whole left arm is now a metal cybernetic replacement. It's a huge difference, but it goes with everything the character has been through, which is a lot. He's a much more sympathetic character, but also such a complete badass. And finally, number one, Ben Riley. Ben Riley was originally known as a hero in the comics. He is the clone of Spider-Man, who also acted as a hero, and at one point was mistaken as being the real Peter Parker. For a while, we, we weren't sure who was the real Peter Parker. For a time, Ben Riley was a main character we'd also follow along with in the comics. He would also go on to take up his own superhero identity, becoming the Scarlet Spider, before Kane took that name, that is. Since the old days though, Ben has become more dark and complex, even becoming known as the villain Jackal. More recently, he's become Spider-Man, but once again has fallen into the tempting pit of villainy, after literally falling into a pit of green ooze. And his look, while definitely Spider-Man inspired, is much different now, with him being known by the villainous mantle of Chasm. This name comes from the memories of Peters that Ben lost as well as some of his own unique memories which were also lost, which sit like a great chasm in his mind, hence the name 
Castle. At number 10 is Tigra, first appearing in her own Marvel comic book called The Cat in 1972. This superhero just doesn't get the spotlight very often. Considering she has been a member of the Avengers in the past, it would only make sense that she might appear more prominently in more recent issues, or even MCU movies. But sadly, her most recent appearance was in a supporting role in Avengers Academy between issues 1 and 39. Tiger's powers began as an experiment by Dr. Joanne Tumalo, who gave her powers attached to her costume. And in this form, she was simply known as the cat. But down the line is when she eventually mutated into Tigra, a human tiger hybrid, through a mystical ritual. She was then bound to a race of humanoid cat people from the Middle Ages, which she could then transform into on command from her human form using the cat's head amulet. She's a pretty cool hero, so I wonder why they haven't really brought her back in any big way. Maybe they found her too similar to DC's Catwoman. Who knows? Next up at number 9 is Stingray, an oceanographer turned superhero who builds his suit in order to explore the depths of the ocean. He helps construct an underwater city covered by a glass dome which he uses to try and grow food for mankind. He first appears in Tales to Astonish number 95 in June of 1967, so he's just on the cusp of the Golden Age. Just about. This guy is no doubt an older Marvel creation and if you haven't heard of him, you may not be alone. Although he has appeared as recently as the Iron Man 2020 event, he still only appears briefly as a side character facing off against Captain Barracuda. But at least the writers of that issue probably had the same thought as me, that he deserves to come around again. Once again, my hunch is that he's just a little too similar to DC's Aquaman, which might keep Marvel from giving him any more spotlight than they already have in more modern issues. Although his buddy Namor, Namor the Submariner, looks like a carbon copy of Aquaman. But Namor appeared for the first time in Marvel's first ever comic book, Marvel Comics number 1 in 1939, whereas Aquaman didn't appear until 1941. But I digress. It just seems that DC found a way to occupy the underwater superhero market, which keeps us from seeing more characters like Stingray and even Namor more often. At number 8, we have DC's The Question, or just Question. Like Stingray, this superhero first appeared in 1967, but isn't showcased very much anymore. Usually teaming up with the Blue Beetle, this superhero got his last solo series in 1987, lasting 36 issues. Issues. He originally had the secret identity of Vic Sage, but was later reimagined in the 2006-2007 miniseries 52, and his protege, Rene Montoya, takes over the mantle. This character is just a good old fashioned fighter, only really having abilities in martial arts and I guess sleuthing since he's a journalist by trade, but he's just got such a simple and cool film noir kind of look and it would be cool to see him in a lead role again. Again though, his abilities and look are strikingly similar to Marvel's Chameleon, so maybe by holding back on popularizing this character too much, they're just avoiding butting heads with their competitors. Once again, it's hard to tell. Okay, at number 7 we've got Marvel's Dominic Fortune, or Dominic Fortunov. This character is not only old in terms of his first appearance in the comics, but the character himself is aged to the point where it's known to be one of his biggest weaknesses. First appearing in Marvel Preview number 2 in 1975, this superhero needs a comeback for the sole reason that he's just a guy. He doesn't have any powers, but fought in World War II and always seems to be getting caught up in assassination attempts and weird odd jobs. Like one time when he had to babysit three drunken actors in Hollywood for a weekend and, and had to call the cops on them after things got out of hand. You know, and after that, Fortune actually gets recruited to the Avengers by Nick Fury in 1959. He's just a good old fashioned human superhero who runs into human troubles and, and stays in his lane, but ends up getting the opportunity still to support the super powered Avengers with bazooka blasts and covert ops. At number six, we we have DC's Dr. Fate. This guy is old. He first appeared in More Fun Comics number 55 in 1940 and basically hasn't been mentioned again since his death in the Book of Fate number one in 1997. So yes, that's a long run, but still I'd like to see more of him. Dr. Fate is a superhero that's got so much going on and looks so cool that I don't know why he isn't used more often these days. His powers come from an incident when he, Kent Nelson, and his father were uncovering the tomb of ancient immortal Nabu and Kent is basically trained by the ancient being and awarded with the amulet of Nabu, a cloak, and a helmet. With the training and these items in his control, he has abilities ranging from magic manipulation and flight to invisibility, super strength, and resurrection, among others. It's just a really cool character based on real ancient myth, and I don't see any reason why Dr. Fate shouldn't have another comeback soon. Number 5, Icarus. If we compare Icarus's first appearance to his latest appearance in the comics, you'll definitely see a pretty big transformation. If we're just going with that first appearance, Icarus makes his first 
first appearance in issue number one of The Eternals, and while his golden locks may stay the same, his outfit has developed a lot more since what we see him in in that first issue. We see him both disguised in civilian clothes and basically potentially wearing a little loincloth and booties, if he's the man flying across the panel that I'm thinking of. I'm pretty sure that's him. That guy also has golden locks and a similar look to Icarus, or at least the attire that he is wearing has a similar look. It's pretty limited though. Icarus in modern comics, whether we're talking about Kieran Gillen's latest and greatest Eternal series or the AXE Judgment Day event, wears a lot more clothes now. Although I will admit, on that first issue of Eternals, there is a little picture of him in his outfit. So sure, but I'm more talking about what happens in the issue. <laughs> his civilian disguise, the sunglasses, the hat. More recently as well, his adaptation in the Marvel Cinematic Universe has him looking quite different additionally, where he was played by Richard Richard Madden, showcasing him as a brunette instead of the more literal golden locked golden boy. That iteration of the character also wore more blue and gold than his comic book counterpart, who lately is often draped in blue and red colors. That's more Icarus in the comics. I guess they had to get the gold in there somewhere, you know what I mean? Number four, The Flash. The Flash is not even the same person as he was originally. He isn't even from the same Earth either. Initially, Jay Garrick was The Flash, appearing back in Flash Comics issue number one. Later on, a new Flash would be introduced to us, and we learned that the original Flash, Jay Garrick, actually existed on another world, known as Earth 2. Barry Allen's Flash would first appear back in the 1950s in Showcase issue number 4, and would continue to be a recurring mainstay in the comics throughout his history, up until today, where Barry is still around even now, and for many people he's still the Flash. Today however, the more prominent Flash I would say, currently in comics, is Barry's nephew, Wally West. That's my Flash, but you know, I respect people that prefer Barry. Wally West as well is a completely different person and also happens to look totally different in terms of his outfit in comparison to the original Flash, Jay Garrick. All in all, the Flash has come a long way throughout the character's history, and while these are just the three main Flashes, the Flash family would also grow exponentially over time. So while they all might not be known as the Flash, there are also just tons of speedsters who are related to the Flashes running around. In fact, we should probably do a Flash family attempting to explain video or a Speed Force attempting to explain video then, in and of itself itself, that concept. Very interesting. Number 3, The Wasp. You might not recognize Janet Van Dyne anymore because I feel like, well, it's been a minute since we've actually seen her as a hero in the comics. Correct me if I am wrong because I really want to be wrong on this as, you know, I, I haven't read everything, but I feel like Janet has been missing for quite a while in the comics, unless I'm wrong. Which is kind of surprising considering she was originally one of the mainstays on the Avengers. I've seen her appear as a friend to Jen and She-Hulk in her civilian form when she lent Jen an apartment, and I know she was dating Iron Man kind of recently, but that's about all I can think of when it comes to Wasp. And I mean, she's not dating Iron Man now because he was with Hellcat, I think, last I checked. What is Iron Man's dating history? <laughs> so strange. Fortunately, Jan is getting her own solo series. Well, she's gonna share it, but you know, the Wasp is getting their own solo series. Possibly the very first Wasp solo series ever, as of 2023, which seems crazy to me. I hope I'm wrong on that one. This series will be shared with Nadia Van Dyne, who is also currently known as the Wasp in the comics. Janet first appeared in issue number 44 of Tales to Astonish alongside Ant-Man, and since then has had quite the evolution when it comes to her look, ditching the Ant-Man coordinated red for a bright yellow and black suit. Nadia also is technically a totally new character who took up the mantle, so totally different person. Despite her full name, she is the daughter of Hank Pym from his first marriage, who grew up imprisoned in Russia. After escaping and coming to America, she learned that her father was dead, but Janet still lived. Bonding with her stepmother, Nadia was inspired to take up her last name instead, which she did with Jan's blessing. Also becoming known as a hero, the Unstoppable Wasp. Which also obviously Janet was like, yeah, you can be the wasp, I'm cool with it. Number two, Green Lantern. Green Lantern, like the Flash, isn't even really the same person anymore if we are comparing modern day to classic. In fact, unlike the Flash in the main continuity event, Green Lantern has more than one modern counterpart. Who was the original Green Lantern? Well, that would be Alan Scott. Alan Scott made his first appearance in All American Comics issue number 16, where he looked very different from our modern day Green Lanterns. And at the same time, even kind of was a completely different Green Lantern in terms of, you know, where his powers came from and kind of how 
they worked, at least until later on when his power's origin was somewhat retconned. The modern day Green Lantern I'm sure most would think of is Hal Jordan. But there has also been Guy Gardner, Jon Stewart, Kyle Rayner, Jessica Cruz, and more recently Joe Moline, one of my favorite Green Lanterns. And that's just some of the mainstays of the Green Lanterns who hailed from Earth. There are a lot more as well. We've really expanded on Green Lanterns. So now when you say Green Lantern, I feel like instead of people being like, oh yeah, Alan Scott, or oh yeah, Hal Jordan even, people are like, which one are we talk about? Number one, Miss Marvel. Miss Marvel was originally introduced to us in the comics as Carol Danvers in the late 60s. Carol herself worked with the US military as a member of the Air Force before becoming a security officer for NASA. It was there that she would meet her super heroic mentor and at one point her love interest, Marvell. Eventually, Carol would get powers of her own in the 70s, debut as a superhero herself known as Miss Marvel. Based on that first appearance of the heroic character, we've come a long way in terms of her appearance and even who she is as a person. Carol isn't even Miss Marvel anymore, having gone on to take up the much passed around mantle of Captain Marvel in honor of the late Marvel himself. Although, as I said, it wouldn't just be Carol and Marvel that would use the name Captain Marvel. With Miss Marvel available though, Carol ended up giving her blessing for Kamala Khan, Carol's number one fan, to use the mantle as she started on her own heroic journey. In the comics, Kamala is known as an inhuman with the power to basically modify her form and shapeshift to an extent. Rojas from Earth 311. Rojas is the Earth 311 version of Captain America, Steve Rogers. Get it? Rojas, Rogers? In 1602, Steve Rogers was time displaced from a dystopian future called Earth 460 to this timeline where he met a woman named Virginia Dare. Dare, by the way, according to writer Neil Gaiman, was not an altered version of Alpha Flight Snowbird despite having similar powers and a similar appearance. Anyway, during this timeline, the Roanoke colony does not disappear like it does in our world. Rogers ends up saving the colony from starvation. Or Rajas, really. So what's the difference between him and the 616 Rogers? Well, Rajas is a blonde haired blue eyed Native American who ends up serving as Dare's bodyguard. It was sent back in time when the Purple Man and his government tried to execute Rogers in his original timeline, but instead accidentally sent him back in time instead. Now this event is what triggered this alternate timeline to occur in the first place. Moving on to DC territory with our number 9 spot, Helena Wayne. Helena Wayne is from Earth 2, the home of all of DC's Golden Age heroes, in which the timeline begins at the start of the Golden Age. More on the history behind that later though. Anywho, Helena is the daughter of Bruce Wayne and Selina Kyle Wayne, born in 1957. After Catwoman was blackmailed into returning to crime and lost her life because of it, Helena wanted vengeance and took up the mantle of Huntress. After Crisis on Infinite Earths, she was erased from existence until the new 52 continuity, minus another alternate version of her popping up in the aftermath of 52, which is a different thing. This Helena, who popped up in the new 52, was stranded on Prime Earth with Kara Zor-El and eventually found a way back to her homeworld. But we just skipped over a lot of plot, so you should definitely read her stuff. Up next at number 8, David Banner from Earth 311. David Banner, as you probably guessed, is the alternate version of Bruce Banner. And he was an advisor of King James when he took over as king in 1602. Banner was an advocate of eradicating witch breeds, which breeds basically being the mutants of 1602, and was even sent out to kill Queen Elizabeth's old advisor, Sir Nicholas Fury, at the Roanoke Colony. Now, during the process, he was exposed to energies that transformed him into a large gray monster, which is the 1602 equivalent of the Hulk. He had become the very thing he despised and was forced to rethink his loyalties. Later on, he ended up returning to England and was sentenced to death to be burnt alive at the stake, but Banner transformed into his angrier half and killed King James, taking on the deceased king's armies too, which eventually caused the king's castle to burn down. Hulk would escape the country, residing in China, where he sought to amend his wrongs by joining up with a Buddhist monastery. But you can't take the hero out of superhero, friends, because what did Banner do while he was there? He killed a dragon that was terrorizing the people, one that had murdered the previous emperor of China. And by slaying that dragon, Banner was declared the new emperor. And at number seven, Carlos dragon Javier there. from Earth 311. Carlos Javier is, you guessed it, Charles Xavier. Except this Xavier has a very different origin story. He's a Spaniard living in 1602 England, and similar to his 616 counterpart, he runs his own school. But this one is called the College for the Sons of Gentle Folk. It's actually a haven for those who are considered witch breed, aka mutants, like we mentioned earlier. How very time appropriate of a name. Much like the regular Xavier, he has psychic powers, and his students include a slew of alternates from the X-Men roster, including Roberto Trifus, which is Iceman, Scotius Summerisle, Cyclops, Hal McCoy, Beast, Werner, 
Angel, and John Gray, who is actually a young woman with psychic powers hiding her true identity in order to be a part of the team, who is obviously an alternate for Jean Grey. And her psychic powers are much stronger than her mentor. Later on, Javier would appear outside of the 1602 story arc in Secret Wars, when the remains of Earth 311 became part of Doctor Doom's battle world. It was renamed as King James's England. King James is actually found out to be a witch breed though, and Carlos took over, becoming King Charles the First. And at number six, Sir Nicholas Fury from Earth 311. This version of Nick Fury is exactly how you'd imagine Elizabethan Fury to be. He is an advisor to the Queen and an intelligencer to Queen Elizabeth. He's still missing one eye. And he got his position by excelling on the battlefield, causing him to be knighted and eventually working his way up to the high position he held at the beginning of the 1602 story. After the Queen's untimely death, Fury became a fugitive after betraying King James. He took his witch breed prisoners to sea, claiming that he was going to kill them, but instead left with them to the New World, after helping them invade Latveria. Halfway through into number 5, Danny Phantom. Young Danny Fenton, he was just 14 when his parents built a very strange machine. It was designed to view a world unseen, that realm being the ghost dimension aptly named the ghost zone. When it didn't quite work, his folks, they just quit. Then Danny took a look inside of it. There was a great big flash and everything just changed. His molecules got all rearranged. And then this 14 year old kid gained the ability to transform into a human or into a ghost. Danny Phantom is one of my all time favorite cartoons and it helped to shape me into who I am today. So of course I'm going to include it as a superhero from the past because he's from my past, okay? That's right, I found a way to work it in. While in his ghost form, Danny has multiple abilities, including flight, invisibility, intangibility, and to possess people at first. However, as the series goes on, he gains more abilities, such as ghost rays, which are bolts of energies from his hands, cryokinesis, and his ghostly whale, which he learns sooner than he's supposed to, thanks to a version of himself from the future, who he ends up fighting in the two-part hour-long episode titled Ultimate Enemy, in which at present Danny gets dragged to the future, where he He's turned evil thanks to combining with his primary adversary and uncle Vlad Plasmius. So he also got dragged into the future, thus meaning that he was from the past. Boom! You looking for this? In it for Phantom Rider. Carter Slade was born and raised in Ohio in the mid 19th century, along with his brother Lincoln. Eventually, Carter decided to move out west to the new territories in order to become a school teacher at a new settlement in Montana. However, he came across a group of people slaughtering helpless homesteaders. Though he fought bravely, Carter was eventually defeated shot multiple times and slowly dying from his injuries. He was brought to a native medicine man called Flaming Star, who had many years before seen a shooting star that brought with it a special dust. Flaming Star took this as a sign that a champion would one day be sent to them to fight injustice. He believed that Carter was this champion and gave him most of his costume along with the dust, which Carter used to make the rest of it and tame a white horse he called Banshee. However, Carter would eventually die while trying to save his brother Lincoln from a cave-in, which results in Lincoln taking over the mantle of Phantom Rider. Basically, it's Ghost Rider from the Old West. And I think it's without the demon. <laughs> Getting close to the end in number three, Captain America. After being a kid from Brooklyn who just wanted to help, Steve Rogers volunteered for an experimental procedure to make super soldiers to aid the Americas during World War II. However, after the experiment was successful, the rest of the equipment was destroyed along with the genius behind it. However, after falling from an experimental drone plane into the North Atlantic Ocean, he spent decades frozen in a block of ice in a state of suspended animation. Quite literally being a superhero from the past, even in real world standards, since this was also his reintroduction into the Marvel Comics Silver and Bronze Age. I think we all know this story at this point thanks to the absolute success of the MCU, but it's still easy to forget that Cap was originally from the 40s until comic books were on the rise again in the 60s. Which is really interesting because like in the most literal sense of the word, Captain America is a hero from the past and is probably the most fitting character for this list for that reason. But there are a couple more that I wanted to talk about so I put him at number 3. Penultimately in at number 2, Black Knight. Marvel Comics' first Black Knight, Sir Percy of Scandia, first appeared in the medieval adventure series Black Knight numbers 1 to 5 from Atlantic Comics, the 1950s precursor to Marvel Comics, and this ran in 1955. The original Black Knight is Sir Percy of Scandia, a 6th century knight who serves at the court of King Arthur as his greatest warrior and one of the Knights of the Round Table. While the modern Black Knight seems to be making an appearance in the Eternals, the original Black Knight was recruited by the wizard Merlin and adopts a double identity. He pretends 
to be totally incompetent until changing into the persona of the Black Knight. As the Black Knight, Percy wields the Ebony Blade, which Merlin forged himself from a meteorite. The modern version, known as Dan Whitman, is the original Black Knight's descendant and the supervillain Black Knight's nephew. He inherited the mystical Ebony Blade that carried a curse and took the Black Knight mantle to help restore honor to it. And I gotta, I gotta say, it's a really weird family dynamic that you got going on. This family reunions must be really awkward. Finally, in at number one, Paul Manning. In the year 5700, we see a hero known as Paul Manning, who would appear whenever the world was in danger. However, it was revealed that this Paul Manning was in fact the Green Lantern known as Hal Jordan, who would be brought to the year 5700 by the Solarians. They would also wipe his mind and clear his memories to implant him with new ones, which is where Paul Manning came from. It was a created identity by the Solarians to get Hal to save them whenever they were having issues, or maybe if a really important cat was stuck in a tree. Eventually though, after being brought to the future many times, Hal ended up subconsciously creating an evil doppelganger of himself who took over the Paul Manning identity, and went on to terrorize the Solarians. He would then be defeated by actual Hal and would be converted into a functioning member of society. However, this was also all pre-crisis, and after the collapse of the multiverse this no longer applies to the main continuity version of Manning. But it's still pretty interesting nonetheless. Like, imagine being pulled into the future and not even knowing it. By that logic, any of us could be from any point in the past, and we just wouldn't know. In at number 10 is Franklin Richards. As the child of two members of Marvel's first family, the Fantastic Four, Franklin Richards came to us in comic books as a baby. So, of course, he is going to change over time, but how drastically he has changed kind of surprised me. Given the nature of his reality warping abilities, Franklin has been shown to us as an adult before he had actually reached that age in the continuity. This happened a couple times. The first time he managed to age himself up to look like a blonde version of Jesus, which was hilarious and terrifying all at the same time. There was also a time he was abducted to the future and trained to become a powerful psionic hero calling himself Psylord, which is a stupid name. And yet another time was with Jonathan Hickman's of Fantastic Four when future Franklin was traveling around time interacting with different members of his family, training his younger self, and making Galactus his little herald. The funny thing is that in all those appearances and versions of himself from child to adult, he has been blonde. Now again, his powers kind of mean that he can look whatever way he decides he wants to, but nowadays he's looking a hell of a lot more like his dad, Reed Richards, than he was before. In his teens, Franklin is sporting jet black hair, being super sulky like most teenagers are, and occasionally wearing an X-Men costume as his powers let him alter his own genes to give him an X gene since he believed that he was a mutant. It's a subtle change, but when I first saw him looking like this in the comics, I had no idea who I was actually looking at. He is also currently depowered as far as I know, which is a little upsetting, but also makes him no longer a mutant and just a depowered human mutate. So we shall see what happens there. Number 9, Superman. Starting out with Superman for my first point here on this list, Superman made his first appearance in Action Comics issue number 1 back in 1938. He is one of the oldest characters around and one of the most prolific. Without Superman, the modern day superhero of today may not even exist. However, over the years, he's come a long, long way. He even managed against all odds to settle down, get married, and have a son. That is a rare thing in comics, where time often seems unmoving and endless. However, for Superman, almost nothing is impossible. The movement of life included, apparently. Ending up with his love, Lois Lane, the two had a son together named John. Even when the continuity they were from came to an end, Superman and his family survived, carrying on despite the fact that he wasn't really the new 52 Superman at that time. Eventually, the new 52 Superman, who was romantically tied to Wonder Woman would die and Superman from the New Earth would take his place. Although technically Superman is now kind of a combination of both of those characters, which is kind of weird to think about because Superman and Wonder Woman were together, so what does that mean? Does he remember that? I don't know. Later, we'd get a glimpse into a possible future in Future State where Superman leaves Earth and his son John Kent takes up the mantle. Currently in the comics, John is Superman, with Clark having left Earth for a time, although don't worry, Clark Kent is also still Superman. When John was revealed to be bisexual, those who weren't following comics wrongfully assumed that DC had made Clark Kent queer when in reality the Superman that was revealed to be bi was actually John Kent. This made crazy headlines, but I was also like, I don't think these people quite know 
exactly which Superman they're talking about. But on my end of the spectrum, I'm like, yay, more bi babes. Always love to see that representation myself. Also, John is just such a great character, so I'm happy to see him get a little bit more time in the spotlight. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here on Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us that you love us by clicking that like button. In at number eight is Star Lord. When Peter Quill first appeared in Marvel Comics in Marvel Preview number four from January of 1976, he might as well have been a different character. The tagline on the front of the comic reads, he stalks the galaxies, one man on a mission of cosmic vengeance. Now that's not really the Star Lord we are familiar with today. There's also the fact that his look was reminiscent of Owl Man from the Watchmen comics. Speaking of which, he actually had a pet owl. The comic, and by extension the character, was a lot more serious and fantastical. He also had actual superpowers bestowed by the costume he wore that was given to him by this guy called the Master of the Sun. He could fly without jet boots and in space without any protection. The main things that still remained were some parts of his origin story and the fact that he wielded an elemental weapon that could shoot fire, water, earth, and air. But only one. Now you contrast this character with what most people have come to be accustomed to and there are many glaring differences. Not even physical differences. He's a hugely different character which was probably also influenced by a bit of Chris Pratt's humor. But even in his first appearance with the Guardians of the Galaxy, he's starkly different to his Marvel preview days. Number 7. Elongated Man Elongated Man is a character whose design has been pretty consistent since his first appearance in The Flash issue 112, even now in the comics. But there was a time when his appearance was totally different, and you know, you may have not recognized him there. This happened after Ralph Dibney and Sue Dibney, his wife, died, and then they became ghosts for a bit. But not just ghosts, ghost detectives. Admittedly, as ghosts, Sue and Ralph do look like themselves, but just as civilians in a spectral form. So even though Ralph does look like Ralph, you still might have not recognized him or Sue during their ghostly appearance, because I mean, they were ghosts. It was a cool and short lived time, and I like to talk about it because I love the idea of ghost detectives. I wish we got more of that. To check out Sue and Ralph in their ghostly forms, you can refer to issue number 52 of the 52 comic series. And at number six is Blue Beetle. I will be honest, Blue Beetle kind of flew under my radar for a very long time. I either simply didn't care about him or I just hadn't really known he existed. I don't know which one it was, but it was definitely one of those. And seeing the costume that the original Blue Beetle wore kind of makes me think that maybe it was the first option. That costume absolutely sucked. It was bland as hell and it was basically just Dan Garrett and some leggings and an oversized shirt, a stupid looking cow looking thing and a bad domino mask. It was during World War II, so we're gonna blame this on material shortages, but Every Blue Beetle outfit has been an improvement and redesign of this costume. But now, with Jaime Reyes, the Blue Beetle armor is not just way more advanced and capable, but it looks leagues and bounds better than the original. So much so that it's hard to even draw comparisons between the two. Now, if we put these suits up side by side and change the colors of one of them, almost no one would believe that one was an evolution of the other. So much better now. Thank the Lord. Number five, The Phantom. The Phantom first appeared in comic strips in 1936 in the fictional African country of Bangala after a castaway whose ship was attacked by pirates washed up on shore and was adopted by the locals. He swore revenge on all evildoers and developed the persona of the ghost who walks, otherwise known as the Phantom. The mantle is passed down through generations with each new Phantom being sworn to protect the jungles of Bangala. The Phantom whose adventures are most commonly followed is Kit Walker. The 21st Phantom. Although his purple costume might come across as silly, he was the first hero to wear skin tight clothes and a mask which obscured the pupils, leaving only the white eyes, something that is of course a staple of masked superheroes now. He is also known for wearing two rings, one of which he uses to leave a skull shaped mark on the villains he punches. The Phantom has appeared in comics, novels, serials, and a live action movie in 1996 starring Billy Zane. Number four, The Spider. The Spider was created in 1933 to be a direct competitor to the Shadow. He is really millionaire Richard Wentworth who disguises himself in early appearances by wearing a mask, a wig, and a false hunchback. He has no issues with killing his enemies and always used his ring to leave a spider shaped mark on his victims foreheads so no one but him would be blamed for his actions. He is aided by his manservant Ram Singh and is a master of disguise, adopting several aliases in order to infiltrate and gather information. His stories are notable for being extremely violent, with the various villains death tolls routinely going into the thousands by the end of each story. He was the first pulp hero to be given a live action serial 
1938, where he was given a new look that featured a red spider web, which helped to distinguish him from the shadow. In the years since his pulp novel appearances, the spider has been featured in comic book series published by Eclipse Comics, Moonstone Books, and Dynamite Entertainment, who adopted Spider's serial costume to the page for the character. Number 3. Black Bat There are actually two Black Bats. The first, from 1933, who was a roaming detective who left bat-themed calling cards, and the more popular one from 1939, who debuted around the same time as Batman. Anthony Quinn was a district attorney, until one day in court someone threw a vial of acid in his face, which disfigured and blinded him. Hmm. In the words of Tobey Maguire, it looks very, uh similar. The attack blinded Dent, I mean Quinn, but fortunately a police officer who is dying from gangster's bullets donates his eyes to Quinn. After the surgery, Quinn is not only able to see normally, but can also see in the dark. He becomes a costumed crime fighter who leaves bat-shaped stickers on his victims, so much like the spider, no one else is blamed for his crimes. Because he and Batman hit the stands around the same time, both publishers sued each other, but the editor of DC Comics, Whitney Ellsworth, managed to broker an agreement that made both companies leave each other free to publish Bat-themed stories. Although, Batman certainly is the more well-remembered of the two. Number 2. Sheena, Queen of the Jungle Debuting in January 1938, a full six months before Superman, is Sheena, the very first female superhero to receive her own self-titled book. Sheena was an orphan who was raised by an African witch doctor who taught her how to survive and various African languages. She grew up in the jungle and learned to communicate with its animals. She eventually becomes friends with a hunter named Bob Reynolds, and the two protect the jungle from giants, dinosaurs, cults, vampire apes, and everything else under the sun. Sheena was co-created by Jerry Iger and comics legend Will Eisner, and appeared in comics and pulp novels and received her own TV series in 1955 and 2000, and a live-action film titled simply Sheena in 1984. She is also the inspiration for both Tina Turner's stage persona and the Ramones song Sheena is a Punk Rocker. Like many of the pre-Golden Age heroes on this list, she is currently licensed to Dynamite Entertainment, who released new comics about this classic hero. Number 1. Mandrake the Magician First appearing in newspaper strips in 1934, several historians credit Mandrake, not the Man of Steel, as being the first comic book superhero. He is a stage magician who uses hypnotic gestures to make people see illusions, which he of course also uses to help him fight crime. He has the power to teleport, shapeshift, levitate, and to become invisible. His hat and wand possess great magic and were passed down to him by his father, Theron. He fights both criminals and supernatural threats, aliens, and figures from other dimensions. He's like Zatanna and Doctor Strange rolled into one. Mandrake appeared in comic strips until 2013, but never really had his own comic books, aside from reprints and a few miniseries, one of which was actually released by Marvel. He has guest starred in stories for The Phantom and Flash Gordon, and a series featuring a new character taking up the mantle called Legacy of Mandrake the Magician, which was released in 2020 by Red 5 Comics. He appeared in his own movie serial in 1939, and there have been a few attempts to adapt the character for film and television, but none have panned out. Number 10, Iron Man. I mean, Iron Man has come such a long way since that first classic appearance. He was basically just a guy in a big metal silver suit, after all. Now he's a guy in, well, a big metal silver suit that isn't quite so bulky and actually has a few coats of paint on it. This is because when we first met Tony Stark as Iron Man, he was wearing his very very first suit, in issue number 39 of Tales of Suspense. Here we'd get his origin story, which would explain how Tony Stark was captured and made the suit under the guise of building weapons of war for his captors, when really he was building the suit to help keep him alive and also help him in his escape. This suit of course was built for a specific purpose, that of survival, but over the years Tony would modify his design and improve upon it, even building various suits for specific events as might be needed depending on the circumstances. His most iconic look though often and still involves him wearing his slightly more modern, though still classic colors of red and yellow. He went from silver to gold to red and yellow, I believe. Although now he has more modern coloring in terms of the red and yellow colors. His armor appears a lot more metallic red and gold, which I love. Although I'm sure in the classic comics it was also supposed to be metallic red and gold, but we just have more advanced, I feel like, color 
tech in the future, color tech. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here on Top 10 Nerd, and if you love hearing about some heroes that you know you might not be as familiar with or you might not recognize anymore, we also have a playlist where we show you some alternate versions. So go see some other characters that you, you know, you might not know about now. Number nine, Green Arrow. Green Arrow literally looked like Robin Hood back in the day. Well, minus the now more Robin Hood style goatee that he now sports, because back then I feel like he was usually more clean shaven. Green Arrow is Oliver Queen. Technically his first appearance is no longer even the same Ollie that we have today in the comics, instead relegated to the alternate reality of Earth 2. But still, he was the original Green Arrow, and so if we are talking about classic looks in terms of first appearances, which is exactly what I'm trying to do here. Oliver has made a lot of progress in comparison to his first look and his first self. Currently, Oliver Queen in the Prime Earth main continuity of DC Comics has a much more modern look to him. Well, of course, like I said, minus that classic looking goatee and mustache combo, which is very Robin Hood to me. No longer does he wear a bright green suit with red boots and gloves. Instead, he wears body armor that, while still kind of green is much more muted in tone. And sometimes he wears reddish bracers, which is kind of a throwback to the classic look. But even then, the colors are about where we draw the line when it comes to similarities to that classic look. Well, and obviously he still fights with the bow because he is Green Arrow, so, but that I don't think will ever change. That would be weird if he was like, and now I'm Green Arrow, but I fight with a machete. I'd be like, that's really random, but all right. Unless it's a machete that he can like shoot like an arrow. Number eight, Thor. Thor has always looked super classic when it comes to his Norse heritage, but now he looks even more cosmic, despite really having always been. As the Asgardians are not people from the past, but are instead considered to be aliens of a kind, simply posing as gods on Midgard, aka Earth, where humans once prayed to Odin and the others. I'm sure some still do. Seeing them as godlike figures. I mean, in essence, they are still considered gods, but they're also aliens, because they're you know, cosmic, but also divine. I would say that over the years, Thor's stories and overall appearance and costume have also greatly embraced his cosmic origins more and more. Thor also made his first appearance in Journey into Mystery issue number 83, where he also looked a mite smaller compared to his modern day self. I feel like that Thor is so like, the Thor we have now is like, oh, he's like super deezed. And especially if we consider the Thor and Hulk crossover event, Banner of War, Thor also hulks out here himself and even shattered the Bifrost again after becoming infected by Bruce Banner. So there he might look totally different because you'd be like, what, Thor's the Hulk, what's happening? Number seven, Crimson Avenger. I mean, most people might not even recognize the Crimson Avenger just because they don't know him. He's quite a classic hero, appearing on what I believe was DC's second superhero team ever, the Seven Soldiers of Victory which made their first appearance back in the early 1940s in Leading Comics issue number one. Here Crimson Avenger was Lee Walter Travis. He appeared here sporting a super form-fitting red outfit with a fin on top and yellow underwear over top, as well as yellow boots to match. This look would seemingly endure until Travis met his end in DC Comics Presents issue number 38. Here the question of what happened to him would be answered, and we'd learn after being diagnosed with an incurable disease, Lee decided to don his costume one more time and sacrifice himself to save others. Now, while this might might sound like his original costume because it did sort of come into play super early on. His original costume, however, actually hails from even further back than the 1940s. The Crimson Avenger actually made his first appearance in the late 1930s in Detective Comics issue number 20. Here he sported a suit underneath a red cape with a matching red wide brimmed hat and wielding dual pistols. He died back in the 80s looking very different in comparison to his first appearance. And I guess now you really wouldn't recognize him at all because I don't think we've seen a new Crimson Avenger since, with him remaining dead in regards to comic continuity. Tell me if I'm wrong on that one, but I can't think of a Prime Earth appearance that I've seen. Crimson Avenger? Is he in the Prime Earth? You tell me. Number six, Robin. Jason Todd was once known as Robin. At the time, he was a hero, and while quite stubborn and brash, he did his best to live up to the mantle working alongside Batman. Eventually, however, Jason would end up leaving Wayne Manor and go on a search for his birth mother. During this time, Batman would once again find him just as Jason would find his birth mother. But unfortunately, the Joker would also find Batman and Jason, secretly blackmailing Jason's mother, and in the end, Jason and his mom would end up as the Joker's victims. Jason would seemingly not survive this incident, despite Batman's rush to come to his aid. However, many years later, we learn with the re-emergence of Red Hood that Jason actually hadn't died here, but had managed to survive and return to life, and later Gotham using his new identity, Red Hood. Gone are the days when Jason Todd 
acted as Batman's sidekick Robin, and in his place was Red Hood. At first, a seeming villain, then an anti hero who was unafraid to kill and fought with guns, and now, currently, a brutal vigilante who instead fights with a crowbar because. Symbolism. I actually really like Jason fighting with a crowbar, but I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? Okay, number five, Marvel's Gargoyle. This superhero first appeared in Defenders issue number 94 in 1981, but since then he's actually retired and settled down in Greenwich Village. He even opened a restaurant called Isaac's Oysters. But he did go for one more rip for old time's sake, aiding Iron Man on a mission to take down the android Korvac. But that's sort of been it for him. And what's cool about this superhero is that he was sort of meant to be evil, but just chose was good. He was formed when Isaac Christians agreed to place his soul inside a cursed gargoyle and do the bidding of the six fingered hand. This was all in exchange for his issues to be resolved. But then when he was tasked with capturing Hellcat, a member of the defenders, he couldn't get himself to do it and defied the six finger hand and just sort of kept living on as this like possessed gargoyle who chose good. He kind of reminds me of Beast. He just has this super wholesome energy to him and I just feel like he could do for more of that sweet, sweet limelight. At number four, we have Zeta from Batman Beyond and eventually the Zeta Project cartoon spinoff. The show ran from 2001 to 2002 as part of a spinoff to the Batman Beyond episode Zeta. This character is so wholesome and doesn't get enough attention, having been last seen 20 years ago in what would have been the final episode of the short running series. This synthoid was built for the NSA to keep an eye on terrorist organizations, so his abilities are pretty extensive, being able to shapeshift into just about anyone to infiltrate and carry out covert ops with ease. He's a naive and friendly character who decides to go rogue after realizing that any one of his assassination targets could be innocent. Zeta had such a moment and clearly a huge approval rating since his one episode got him a whole series, but at a certain point, the world forgot about such a good and powerful synthoid superhero that definitely deserves a comeback. At number three, there's Warlord, a character the world hasn't seen since his death in Warlord Volume 4, Issue 12. But there should be some kind of revival of Travis Morgan, who is another character on the list who doesn't actually have any powers, but is just a very well respected and decorated war veteran. He also looks a lot like Oliver Queen or Green Arrow, which could have had something to do with it. They sort of acknowledge this when they finally meet in the same comic and all of the Seattle underworld mistake Warlord for Green Arrow and attack him on sight. But whatever the reason is, Warlord's legacy deserves to be acknowledged with another appearance of some kind. I mean, the lore behind the character is that in past lives he's been Sir Lancelot, Dartignan of the Three Musketeers, and Crazy Horse, among other legendary warriors and soldiers. He's just a great human character with, might I add, a really cool costume and some badass accolades to boot. Bring him back. Okay, at number two on the list, we've got Komodo. This superhero really was a flash in the pan, only appearing on and off for a few years and having her legacy end with her powers being stripped. For a time, until they're restored again by Cloud9 and Hardball. But that's sort of it. And I think the last time she's been seen is in the Fear Itself storyline, which wrapped up in 2011, which is 11 years ago now, believe it or not. But this character needs to reappear in some way. The superhero was first created because Melody Kusama lost her leg in a serious car accident, and none other than Dr. Connors from, yes, the Spider-Man series, decides to endow her with the regenerative powers of a lizard. Well, not only that, of course, she actually turns into a lizard fully and at will and gains super strength, speed, agility, stamina, all that good stuff. I think this this story is a good one to retell because who doesn't love a good story where someone confined to a wheelchair is able to not only walk again but fight crime and be pretty damn good at it. Okay, last on the list is just my personal favorite, arguably obscure superhero 3D Man. An athlete turned superhero, 3D Man mysteriously gains superpowers after being stripped of his three Olympic gold medals. I mean, he was taking steroids, but there's always room for redemption, right? This character first appeared in 1998 and no one ever really talks about him. And to be honest, I didn't even know he existed until I started writing this list. And I want this hero to get more spotlight primarily because I'm a sucker for early 2000s culture and this character is just such a great time capsule for that period, where everybody was obsessed with 3D for some reason, with DVDs coming with 3D glasses in the case, remember that? And 3D Man has the same nostalgic look to him, with many of his appearances being colored in green and red. If you want to look him up yourself, you'll notice that he originally went by the name of Triathlon and later changed to 3D Man during the Secret Invasion storyline. This guy just looks so cool and hits home with some good nostalgia for me, as well as probably anyone from the Gen Z or Millennial generations. And there's also just a silly factor there too. 3D Man needs to come back. Please, can we? 
just for one second. In a 10, Tony Stark. Wilson Fisk's men attempted to kill Anthony Stark in order to silence his drunken singing, forcing Sheriff Rogers to intervene and save his life. Tony Stark later donned the suit of battle armor to save the life of Red Wolf. However, this suit looks more like a train than a battle mech suit, and in all honesty, it's the perfect combination of these two things. First appearing in 1872 number one from 2015, this version of the Iron Man armor is one that I want to see someone cosplay because holy damn, this look is based off the original Iron Man suit and like, you know, the, the one Tony Stark built in a cave with a pile of scraps. Yeah, it's that one, but make it dark steampunk, basically. But by steampunk, I also mean steam engine. Well, combustion engine. I don't, I don't know much about trains. You know the train that Marty and Doc use to get the DeLorean up to 85 and then back to 1985 and back to the future part three? Yeah, that, but an Iron Man suit. I feel like the Tony from 1972 was the one who made the t that, that train fly and time travel. I feel like he was the one that Doc went to. In a nine, Gazer Beam. Simon J. Palladino, also known as Gazer Beam, is a minor character in The Incredibles. He only briefly appears in the film alive, but his disappearance and death really is what sets the events of the movie into motion. Gazer Beam was a member of the superhero team known as the Phantasmics, but conflicts with Everseer led him to leave the team and he soon joined with the Thrilling Three as their new leader upon the death of Dynaguy, which he also later left. He appeared alive at the wedding of Elastigirl and Mr. Incredible, but during the superhero ban, Gazer Beam was an activist for superhuman rights, wanting the ban on supers to be revoked. Fifteen years later, he would be one of the most recent victims of the Omnidroid, with Bob having noticed his disappearance becoming a story in the newspaper. His final act before dying, though, was to use his powers to carve Kronos on the cave wall in which he was hiding, in the hopes that someone would discover it and put an end to Syndrome's evil schemes. An act that was really what made the Incredible was able to stop Syndrome scheme and save the day, since without it, Bob wouldn't really have learned what the mission was. And yes, I used a character from The Incredibles on this list because he was a superhero in the past. Deal with it. And it ain't Stardust the Super Wizard. However, this is a case of a superhero forgotten in the past. So another use for the term from the past. Stardust the Super Wizard is a fictional superhero from the golden age of comics who originally appeared in American comic books published by Fox Feature Syndicate and first appeared in Fantastic Comics number one in 1939. Stardust the Super Wizard was featured in 16 issues of Fantastic Comics and this was before superheroes were really trying to be better than criminals as Stardust would basically kill all of his enemies in various ways with his wide array of powers. And when I say wide array of powers, I mean it. This guy has about as many powers as a lantern core, if not more. Superhuman strength, speed, durability and endurance, vast knowledge of interplanetary science, master of space and planetary forces, skilled detective, formidable brawler, accelerated perception, extrasensory perception, augmented respiration, interplanetary flight, indestructibility, telepathy, transportation, metamorphosis, transmogrification, telekinesis, selective omniscience, which is awesome, and luminous skywriting. And then throw on whatever other powers he needs to have thanks to the story because he's a freaking wizard and it's 1939. This with the combination of just offing people he didn't like makes him absolutely nuts. But I love it. And it's seven, Dark Knights of Steel. Coming in November of this year, Dark Knights of Steel will basically be DC meets Game of Thrones. The series is written by Tom Taylor and takes place in a medieval fantasy world where a spaceship crash lands from a doomed planet. So not only will the Dark Knight be here, but so will Superman and Wonder Woman, along with Harley Quinn, Black Lightning, and more. Tom Taylor told Entertainment Weekly, quote, I've spent the last two years creating a new epic fantasy universe for DC Comics, and Dark Knights of Steel is an absolute dream come true. Despite being the writer of the DC horror series Deceased, I am actually a huge fantasy fan, combining two of my favorite things, DC superheroes and high fantasy. It's my absolute happy place, and honestly, I couldn't agree more. I love medieval stuff. It's why I love Skyrim and Game of Thrones and why my name is the Cheese King. I love fantasy stories and I can't wait to sink my teeth into this one, especially when in the preview we got for this series, we can see what is in essence a character sheet based or like character stats for Superman. So if they include one of these with every issue, you can have a real DC based fantasy Dungeons and Dragons game with like official stats. And that sounds f***ing awesome. Who do you hope shows up in this series? I'm hoping to see The Flash, but like medieval, but like, hey, you let me know your thoughts down below. And it's six, Agron Bat. 
Agon Bat is a Japanese superhero created by Suzuki Ichiro and Takeo Nagamatsu in 1931, who originally debuted in a Kameshibai, which is a paper theater. Ogun Bat is considered by some to be the world's first superhero, and is a precursor to later superhero characters such as the Japanese Prince of Gamma, as well as well-known comic book characters like Superman and Batman. Ogun Bat was created by 16-year-old Takeo Nagamatsu and 25-year-old Suzuki Ichiro in 1931, and the two were inspired by drawings of mythological characters in Tokyo's Unio Royale Museum to create a new hero based on science rather than mythology. Ogun Bat is a being from ancient Atlantis who was sent forward in time 10,000 years to battle evil forces threatening the present day. He has a golden skull shaped head, wears a green and white swashbuckler outfit with a high collared red cape, and carries a rapier. His superpowers include superhuman strength, invulnerability, and the ability to fly. Plus, I mean, he was sent 10,000 years in the future, so if that's not the past, then I don't know what is. Speaking of Fury, let's look at his apprentice, Peter Parkwok. Peter Parkwok is an alternate of Peter Parker from Earth 311, and he's also Sir Nicholas Fury's assistant and apprentice. Later known as the Spider, this version of Peter was raised by his Scottish uncle Benjamin until Fury showed up at his door. Fury, who had known Peter's parents before they died, wanted Peter to enter into his service, causing Peter to change his last name from Parker to Parkwok in order to hide his Scottish origins. The English weren't fans of the Scottish at this time. His adventures as an adult saw him taking on 1602 versions of some of Spider-Man's most famous foes, including King's Pin, Bullseye, and Baron Octavius. Wonder who they are. He even fell for this world's alternate of Mary Jane, an actress at the Globe Theatre named Marion Watson. Unfortunately, he would meet his demise when Moreland showed up during a performance at the Globe and overpowered him, staking him to one of the Globe's support beams, and also crashing the theatre down. Peter was killed, and Moreland stole his life essence before disappearing to another dimension. Moving on to number 4, we have Alan Scott from DC, Earth 2. Alan Scott is the Green Lantern of Earth 2 and had a very different origin story than the Silver Age Hal Jordan Green Lantern. After a railroad accident occurs, Alan begins to hear a voice coming from one of the train's lanterns, and he gets a ring from said lantern that he needs to recharge via the lantern every 24 hours. After a crisis on Infinite Earths, Alan ended up being merged into New Earth where his origins were retconned slightly. And then, after 52, it was revealed that he had died a long time ago and was succeeded by his daughter Jade. But then of course the new 52 happened in a brand new reboot. And Scott returned with a brand new backstory that riffed off of his history. This time around though, Scott was gay. And his story started with him being on vacation with his boyfriend Sam, who he planned to propose to. But before he could, the train they were on crashes, and a mysterious green flame protects Scott and heals his wounds. Sam doesn't survive. Scott decides to avenge his love by using his newfound power to protect the world. And his ring? Well, he used that engagement ring as a foundation for his Green Lantern ring. Aww. The feels. Up next in our number 3 spot, Dr. Stephen Strange from Earth 311. Strange in this alternate universe is the Queen's physician, Queen Elizabeth I. Strange is also a magician and an alchemist and was married to Clea Strange, an alternate of Clea who was from another dimension. When he was a boy, he was kidnapped by foreign sailors and sold into slavery, eventually landing in the care of a doctor, who told him if he was able to find specific herbs from the east, he would grant Strange his freedom. This is where he learned of magic and saved Clea, eventually marrying her. He returned to England and found himself aiding Queen Elizabeth I, who then made him her personal physician. Strange believed that their world was coming to an end and confided in Nick Fury. Eventually, his scheming with Fury was outed, and so was the plan to go behind the crown's back to prevent catastrophe from occurring. When King James took over, he imprisoned Strange for treason and beheaded him. Cleo would return his head to the Roanoke colony, fulfilling the promise she made to Strange, asking the heroes to bury his head with the rest of his body there before she departed back to her home dimension. And at number two, Power Girl. Cora Zor first appeared in All Star Comics issue 587 in 1976. She is Superman's cousin, but from an alternate universe being Earth 2 of course. Finding herself stranded in the main DC universe after a cosmic crisis on her homeworld, she ended up working alongside Superman and her alternate self, Supergirl. In comparison to her counterpart, she is much more mature and level headed, and more aggressive in combat. Unlike some of the other Earth 2 heroes on our list though, she had a really odd retcon experience after Crisis, resulting in her origins being changed so that she was actually the granddaughter of an Atlantean sorcerer. Clearly people weren't into it, so that was retconned. And during the 2005-2005 2006 Infinite Crisis story arc, she was returned to being a refugee of Krypton from Earth 2. 
thankfully. And last but not least, in our number one spot, we have Jay Garrick. Jay Garrick, the Flash, lands at the top spot on our list not just because he's a Golden Age hero who resides on DC's Earth 2, or because he's a complete distinct other version of the Flash from an alternate timeline. Really, it's because he was the pivotal Earth 2 character to bridge the gap between DC's multiverse with Barry Allen, and essentially helped create the multiverse, or a shared universe as it was called then, by appearing in the Flash issue 123 and its storyline Flash of Two Worlds. Earth 2 was created to explain the differences between the Golden Age and the Silver Age, in which heroes have begun their crime fighting careers at the beginning of the Golden Age and the dawn of World War II. They would reside there, yet they could appear in stories with the current iteration of heroes and not mess up the continuity. Anywho, Jay Garrick got his speedster powers in a different way. As a college student, he accidentally inhaled something called hard, or heavy as it was retconned, water vapors, after falling asleep in his lab where he had been smoking, of course. It's so very golden age. He awakens to discover that he has superhuman speed and ends up using his football jersey and his father's helmet from World War II to make himself a costume. He was also one of the founding members of the Justice Society of America, who was the predecessor to the Justice League. Garrick would fall into obscurity though, replaced by the new, more science fiction based Barry Allen Flash, until that fateful story in Flash issue 123, which changed the fabric of the DC Universe forever. Number 10, Daredevil. No, not that Daredevil. This Daredevil is Bart Hill, who witnessed his father's murder before the killer branded him with a hot iron, making him mute with shock. He learned to become an expert boomerang thrower and became a costumed crime fighter. He was later rendered unmute with no explanation and honestly isn't that interesting. He actually appeared after Superman, but fell into the public domain and has therefore been used by several different publishers, although they often change his name to avoid conflicts with the Marvel legal team. Number 9, Miss Fury. First appearing in 1941 in newspaper strips published by Bell Syndicate, Marla Drake was a wealthy socialite who was attending a party when she discovered that another woman was wearing the same outfit as her. In order to prevent embarrassment, she changed into a ceremonial panther skin outfit that her uncle had taken from Africa and willed to her. The suit of course granted her superpowers, which she used to fight crime and achieve a level of cultural appropriation most white people can only dream of. Talk about my culture is not a costume. Her powers are basic acrobatic, climbing and fighting powers, and she was known for using her claws and whip against her enemies. She actually didn't use the suit very often, as her manservant, a Brazilian albino Indian named Albino Joe, Jesus Christ. Well, he warned her that every favor that was gained through black magic would result with two misfortunes. Her comic strip appearances were later compiled by the company that would one day become Marvel, Timely Comics. This has made the rights to her a little hard to follow, as she is considered canon to the Marvel Universe, but also has appeared in comics published by both Malibu and Dynamite Comics. What makes her notable is that Miss Fury was the first female superhero to actually be created by a woman. All right, that's all of the characters who you could argue were part of the Golden Age. From here on out, all of the entries were created before Superman first appeared in June 1938. Number 8, Doc Savage. Doc Savage, the Man of Bronze, first appeared in Doc Savage magazine number 1 in 1933, five whole years before Superman. He appeared in pulp magazines, which would tell the stories of the character in prose with some illustrations, rather than in a purely visual medium as comics would end up doing later. In 2016, Stan Lee actually went on record as saying that Doc Savage was the forerunner to modern superheroes as we know them. Doc Savage's story is that his father assembled a group of scientists who were all experts in their fields to train his son almost from birth to make him a perfect human specimen who is at peak human condition and is a master martial artist and scientist, physician, inventor, explorer, and detective. He was raised in the jungle where he received a really intense tan, earning him the nickname the Man of Bronze. After his father was killed, he decided decided to devote himself to fighting crime, traveling the world and battling criminals. He is extremely rich and has a base in the Arctic that he calls the Fortress of Solitude. He is aided by a team of friends known as the Fabulous Five, who are all experts in their scientific fields, but of course not as expert as Doc Savage is. In his third appearance in 1933, Quest of the Spider, he is referred to as a Superman by one of his colleagues. Doc Savage has appeared in pulp novels, radio stories, and movies over the years, but isn't nearly as 
well known as the hero he inspired. He has made comic appearances for both Marvel, DC, and Dark Horse over the years. Number 7. The Green Hornet This is a character you are likely at least aware of due to the Seth Rogen movie and the classic 60s television show starring Bruce Lee, but the Green Hornet's history goes back even further than that. First appearing in his own radio series in 1936, the Green Hornet is really Britt Reed, the owner of the Daily Sentinel newspaper. At night, the Green Hornet fights evil with the help of his driver, Kato, in their supercar, the Black Beauty. What makes the Hornet unique is that he pretends to be a criminal so that he can infiltrate the various gangs of his city in order to take them down. In a fun bit of lore building, Britt's father is actually Dan Reed Jr., the nephew of the Lone Ranger. The Green Hornet made the jump from radio to the big screen in 1940, appearing in two serials, The Green Hornet and The Green Hornet Strikes Again. He appeared from time to time in his own comic book series, which adapted his radio stories, but his most iconic appearance was in the 1966 television show, which starred Van Williams as the Hornet and Bruce Lee as Kato. The show was made by the same team who made the 60s Batman show, but employed a more serious tone than the campy Batman show. It lasted for one season, but has managed to stay in the public consciousness, being the main inspiration for the 2011 film. The license for Green Hornet Comics is currently with Dynamite Comics, who have taken him back to his Depression era roots. If you want to familiarize yourself with the Hornet's sting, might I recommend Chuck Wagner's Green Hornet Year One. Number 6. The Shadow <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the Shadow knows! First created in 1930, The Shadow was originally the narrator of the Detective Story Hour radio program, which was created to help boost the sales of Detective Story magazine. People began asking the newsstand vendors for uh, that Shadow Detective magazine, and the publishers decided to develop an actual character for the narrator and give him his own pulp magazine series. The Shadow Magazine, which by 1937 received its own radio series. There were some inconsistencies between the character in the radio program and magazine appearances, so we'll go with the more well-known version of the story. The Shadow is a man who has traveled the world and learned how to cloud men's minds and become invisible, hiding in the shadows to attack criminals. He has taken over the life of a wealthy playboy named Lamont Cranston, whose identity he uses to fund his exploits and gather intel from his friend, the police commissioner. If this sounds kinda Batman-y to you, then you would be right, as the Shadow was a major influence on Batman's modus operandi. In fact, the Shadow story, Partners of Peril, was lifted almost verbatim by Bob Kane when he wrote the first Batman story featured in Detective Comics number 27. Both feature the hero investigating a series of murders of a group of businessmen who own a chemical syndicate together. Both feature the hero getting trapped under a glass dome that fills with gas that they then plug with a handkerchief, proving once again that Bob Kane was a talentless hack who would have never been remembered if it weren't for Bill Finger. The Shadow has appeared in pulp magazines and radio dramas and films over the years. His most recent feature film was in 1994, starring Alec Baldwin as the title character. It's actually pretty underrated. The character is currently licensed to Dynamite Comics and has a pretty extensive catalog of appearances available for readers. Number 5. Earth 15513, 1872. Technically, Earth 15513 is Battleworld, which is actually part of the modern Secret Wars story. The pocket dimension of the Valley of Doom is made of another Earth's version of the Wild West, mainly the town of Tamley. Tamley is run by its mayor, Wilson Fisk, and his enforcers, who ultimately answer to Governor Roxon. Stephen Rogers is the sheriff in this here town, and he's a bitter but just man after the death of his deputy, Bucky Barnes. Anthony Stark is the town drunk, regretful of how his weapons were used in the Civil War. Natasha Romanoff is the widow of Bucky, with Bruce Banner being the doctor of the town. The new hero, Red Wolf, tries blowing up the Roxxon Dam, which almost results in his lynching, if it weren't for Sheriff Stephen Rogers, who saves him. Conflict blossoms when the agents of Roxxon, Bullseye, Grizzly, Elektra, and Dr. Octopus arrive in town and start a running amok. Another story you have to read, I promise the steampunk looking Iron Man will not disappoint you. Number 4, Earth 717, Captain America in THE Civil War. The What If stories are so cool. In What If Captain America, Stephen Rogers actually fought in the American Civil War instead of World War II as General America. 
Given powers from an ancient Native American eagle that also turned an evil racist Bucky Barnes into the White Skull, who became the leader of a white supremacist group. Because of General America's involvement in the Civil War, the Union won the war a year earlier than it normally would have. Abraham Lincoln survived his second term in office. He helped rebuild the South, suppressed the rise of a certain group of hooded racists, and prevented the Indian Wars from ever happening. He would go on to fight the White Skull and his new deadlier hate group, eventually being succeeded by a line of Captain Americas who were his descendants. Well hey there time traveler, you're from the time period where YouTube still lets you like and subscribe right? Well if you're enjoying this video right here, why don't you just go and hit that thumbs up. It sure helps us out a lot. Alrighty, let's get on to the top three. Number three, Earth 90214, Marvel Noir. In this alternate version of Earth, superheroes debuted in the 1920s and 30s instead of their normal timing. This Earth 90214 brought us Marvel Noir, with subsequent noir versions of Punisher, Wolverine, Iron Man, Daredevil, Luke Cage, the X-Men, and most famously, Spider-Man. Each story is a fresh, unique, and awesome take on each character, seeing how superpowers in this world are pretty much non-existent except for a few characters. For example, Spider-Man was bitten by a spider, but instead of being based in science, his powers derived from a spider god. Or Wolverine didn't actually have claws, he just carries like brass knuckle blade things. Another example would be the X-Men, who are actually a group of sociopathic criminals, led by an Xavier who believed sociopathy was the future of the human species, which is just incredible. Number two, Earth 811, Days of Future Past. Earth 811 is a future timeline where Sentinels rule over North America. After their creation, almost all mutants have been hunted and exterminated. The mutants that were not killed are kept in concentration camps. Even the heroes who aren't mutants have been exterminated. The Avengers, the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Daredevil, they're all gone. But hey, this is the future, not the past. Yeah. I'm getting there, okay? Rachel Summers, the daughter of Jean Grey and Scott Summers, uses her telepathic powers to send Kitty Pride's mind back into her younger self's body. Specifically, Kitty's mind went all the way back to the Halloween of 1980, where she informed the X-Men of what their future could become, and they prevented the assassination of Robert Kelly. The story is a whole lot more complex than that, and is also one of the most prized Marvel stories, so give it a read! Number one, Earth 311, Marvel 1602. Okay, Marvel 1602 is my absolute favorite Marvel alternate universe. Fun fact, it was the first Marvel writing escapade for superstar fantasy writer Neil Gaiman. The universe actually got its start in a different alternate reality, Earth 460, where Purple Man became president for life. Most heroes had been hunted down or had died from old age, but after Captain America is captured, he is banished away to Earth 616's 1599, shortly before Roanoke was formed, which inadvertently created Earth 311. For some reason, the presence of Captain America destabilized reality and began the emergence of heroes and villains into this world who are counterparts to many of the present day heroes and villains of the Marvel Universe. Count Otto Von Doom the Handsome, Witchbreed, which are mutants, Grand Inquisitor Enrique, which is Magneto, Carlos Javier, which is Charles Xavier, Four from the Fantastic, Sir Nicholas Fury, Peter Parqua, David Banner. The story is so interesting, intertwining actual history with superpowered beings. I highly recommend you give it a read if you haven't already. Music